our work in justice making has been an important part of our history. They talked, what they did talk about was what it's beginning to look like now and what it will look like into the future and who is all going to be a part of it in the coming years in our congregations. So at the end of last year's regional assembly, we on the staff began to think about the theme for this year. And the obvious question was who, who would be part of our new journeys in justice? So these questions shaped our theme for this year and the who in the new era. These questions were, who will we as Unitarian Universalists need to be to be relevant? How will we get there? And who will be joining us on this journey? And these questions shaped the conversations that we had with our keynote presenters leading up to this weekend. So I'm just gonna briefly introduce them and they will tell you a little bit more about themselves when they speak. Elizabeth Nguyen is, uh, works in the Unitarian Universalist's Office of Youth and, youth and Young Adult Ministries, and she supports youth and young adults of color. Ken, uh, Kenny Wiley is a senior editor at the UU World, and he is also the, the director of religious education at a Unitarian church in Colorado. And Jeremy Nickel is the minister at Mission Peak Unitarian Universalist Church in the Bay Area of San Francisco. They are here because I spoke with a number of people last summer about who they would like to hear from as we, think, we thought about these questions. And their names were near the top of almost everyone's list. So I'm really excited to, have, to hear what they have to say, hear their conversations over tonight and tomorrow morning, and want to welcome them. And we'll get started. Thank you. How y'all doing? What's up? All right. I'm Kenny Wiley. Dory, thank you for the introduction. Uh, they decided I would go first, so here I am. Um, so as Dory said, I live in Denver, Colorado, and I work as the director of faith formation at Prairie UU in Parker, which is a suburb of Denver. Also a senior editor for UU World magazine, so when you all dutifully read your UU World, like I know you all do, um, usually when I go to a UU's house, they're always like in the bathroom. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's like, y'all could have just like faked it when I come over at least, but anyway, whatever. So I'm also really active in Black Lives Matter in Denver and on the core leadership team for 5280, which is what we call our Denver chapter in honor of our high altitude in the Mile High City. So, gosh. So what the format, since I'm speaking first, I give you a little sample of the format. We each decided we'd talk for 10 to 12 minutes, um, kind of outlining, tackling one of those questions that Dory laid out for you, and then that we would have a conversation. Um, we, asked, we thought it'd be like cool to just sit after we each give our presentation, sit and chat. And again, we're hopeful for tomorrow morning session that you will write some questions, give them to us tonight, so then we can have further dialogue um, and invite you all in uh, tomorrow morning. So a little bit more about me. I just wanted to give a shout out being in this region. Uh, I went to the University of Missouri, Columbia. Any Missourians in the house? Okay, well, all right. We're kind of far. Um, so I just wanted to give that, give some love to my fellow Missourians as well. So I want to tell you a story. Um, about a youth con in Denver in January of this past year. But to begin to tell you that story, I want to tell you that I grew up Unitarian Universalist. Um, my paternal, that's your dad, right? Paternal grandmother, y'all like, okay, yeah. Um, I always get that backwards. Paternal grandmother found Unitarian Universalism in the early 70s. Uh, so she's a black woman in Arkansas who just found this church full of white people that she thought was cool. Um, <laughs> She started going, and then she took my dad, who was in college at the time, he's like, you should come to this. And so that's how I became UU, and my parents met at a UU church uh, in Austin, Texas. So I'm super, super UU and pumped to like, talk to you all about Unitarian Universalism. Um, so I did youth cons, we called them rallies in Texas where I grew up, but we, I did youth cons, and there's a, there's a song that we would sing at every, the beginning of every rally called uh, Three Chartreuse Buzzards. Anyone know this one? I'm not going to say. Meg Riley does. Okay. I see you, Meg. Um, Meg probably knows everything. So 
So I'm not going to sing the song for you, but I'm going to tell you that there's, so basically these three buzzards, you sing about how these three buzzards get lost um, and they fly away. And at one point in this song, that's a repeat after me song, the whole congregation yells, stop, look. And for some reason, as I was preparing and talking to these two lovely folks, that refrain, stop, look, when I thought about who I wanted Unitarian Universalism to be going forward, you know, what a big question, like, who are we to be if we are relevant? I thought of us, I was like, what if we were the stop, look people? And I tell you that because of this story that now being a youth advisor, um, over 10 years after my time as a high school UU, that there was, so the folks in Denver are super pumped the youth are super pumped for racial justice, for Black Lives Matter, for all kinds of justice work, just like I know this room is, if the opening worship is any indication. And so we planned a whole con that would be Black Lives Matter, that the, all the content would be hearing from uh, black folks in terms of videos, in terms of commercials, in terms of uh, scholars who live in Denver, all sorts of stuff. It was awesome. And powerful and we planned it and it was going really well so this con was MLK weekend and we started on Saturday so we get into Sunday and we start to hear rumors that so Denver there's something called the Maraid and the Maraid is just what it sounds like it's a march plus a parade and it's in honor of MLK so it was be it began in the 80s um, as this very countercultural, you know, gathering of a few hundred folks, maybe several hundred folks, and that they were going to march in honor of Dr. King. And what happened is over time, it got cooler and cooler to do, and then eventually the establishment, the politicians and, you know, media folks and their floats, and it turned into this big party of like 20,000 people just chilling um, and marching down uh, Colfax Avenue, one of the most populated streets in Denver. So that's the setting. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because there was a gathering, uh, a multi-generational gathering of people who said, what if we took back the Maraid? That we felt like we were following people who weren't interested in Black Lives Matter and we think Dr. King and those who marched and worked with him would be with us in Black Lives Matter. So what if we took back the Maraid? So the youth, being all about Black Lives Matter, got wind of this. Um, some folks said, well, what if we joined this marade? What if we joined this, like, taking over of the marade? And what that means is there was going to be five or six, seven hundred people who were going to take this secret route that wasn't secret, but whatever. Take the secret route and go in front and become the community would be leading the marade instead of the dignitaries. So the youth were like, what if we did that? Pumped, they're fired up. Now, of course, a lot of y'all work with youth or have youth. You're like, wait a second, this sounds like illegal and stuff. <laughs> well, it was. <laughs> so as people of faith who were talking, spending a weekend in a church, First Unitarian Denver, there was a question, would we, what would we be willing to risk? And then there's the further questions of like, we have people's children. <laughs> So it's a huge mess. And because I have, oh gosh, you get so excited when you're up here. Okay, so I'm gonna keep speeding along here. But, so the youth leaders decide we're gonna talk about this as a community. And what happened was somebody decided it would be good if we voted and that it had to be unanimous whether we were gonna join the illegal yeah, I know, right? We're going to join the illegal action or not. Needless to say, there was a vote. It was not unanimous. Uh, you could get three UUs for that vote, and it wouldn't be unanimous, right? Uh, well, maybe, yeah. So not so much. So then there's all this, so like we're going to stick with the original plan, and we're going to march Monday morning, yay. There's a 15-year-old there's a named Grace who lives in Grand Junction. She's a uh, biracial girl, identifies as black. Grand Junction, if you're not familiar with Colorado, is way out west. 
not a big town, I see some nods. And she like raises her hand as we're all talking and debriefing and she says, you know, I feel really hurt by this community. And she says, I feel like we've talked about Black Lives Matter all weekend and then we had a chance to do something and we're not gonna do it. And what happens is this mostly white body of people, of, of high schoolers and adults, you know, it's awkward in the room, it's super quiet. Like she's just said, y'all let me down. And several people put their hands up and they say, Grace, thank you so much for sharing. I just like feel so moved by what you said. And you know, we're not gonna do it this time, but like just thank you so much. Yeah, right. Um, so she feels so upset and storms out of the room. And I've been thinking about that moment for months and months. So what happened was several of the youth of color felt the same way who were in that space. And a lot of the white youth did too. And I did too. I mean, my job is there as an advisor, but I was disappointed. And so, but you know, it was like the, the leadership decided we're just going to stay on schedule. We're going to stay on schedule. We're going to go back, go on to the next thing. And I had this moment. Remember that the refrain from the song, stop, look. I was like, what if we just said, you know what, screw the schedule. Because what was clear was we needed to like talk about what just happened. So we can't just like go on and like keep going with Black Lives Matter. Because like Black Lives Matter was happening like live in the room, right? <laughs> so, so I said, basically, stop, look. And I, so I went around and luckily there were two other religious professionals of color there also and we called it a caucus. And if you're not familiar with that, we gathered all the people of color at the con who were willing to do so, and we talked. And again, we said, let's stop the whole process. What if we just said, like, what, do, what if we centered ourselves and said, what do we need? So this group of youth of color, and by the way, we have no seniors of color in our district in Colorado. They were all freshmen and sophomores. So, they don't, so they're like, about to tell these, you know, six, 12, 18 year old peers of theirs what they need from them. And they do. And not only that, they eventually kick the other, me and the two other advisors of color out of the room because they're like, well, you're taking up too much space too, so thank you for your contribution. <laughs> yeah, which was awesome. So, the stop, look people. There's so, there were so many things going on in that room at once. So many cultural norms or un, unchecked, unexamined assumptions. Somebody spoke up, raised their hand and said, I think what we are doing is disappointing. And there was this cultural norm, I would argue a white cultural norm, that said we had to smooth, immediately smooth over the indifference or the, the conflict. And... There were a lot of folks in there who've been to a lot of Black Lives Matter trainings, a lot of trainings around all sorts of things. And nobody, like, nobody, I'm just gonna say it, none of the white folks in the room, like, we need to stop here. We need to, like, break down what's happening. And I keep thinking about, like, it had to be me, and that's fine, that's my job. But I was like, what if it didn't have to be me? What if somebody, like, however imperfectly just said, stop, look, like, this seems off. Can we just talk about this a second? When I think about the people I want us to be, the faith I want us to be, we are a faith of folks who loves trainings, you love inviting pleasant-looking folks like us here from all over the country to come chill and chat. But, like, what if we were the folks who used that training and just said, gosh, something's happening here. So I wanna, before I, move, before I pass it on to the next colleague of mine, I just wanna close my opening here with what ended up happening that night. So what ended up happening after they decided like, oh, we're gonna center ourselves and then we're gonna throw the advisors who helped us out of the room, which I was super pumped about, what they decided to do was they wanted to, tell, they wanted to tell their white peers and the white advisors, the white adults, just like how they'd been hurt. They weren't attached to outcome. They just said, this is 
how you made us feel. I know you meant well. Reverend Don was just up here talking about that oops, ouch, and owning the intent. Here was your intent, and here was the impact. So, you know, it's getting like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and there are tear-filled rooms of people um, listening and sharing. And I just, I've, I've never felt more Unitarian Universalist than I, was, than I felt in that space. And the reason I felt that way is because we were, the, we were a group of people with different experiences and different understandings and different truths and different stories who just were willing to stop and listen and be in the moment. And what came of it was that, well, wait, we could, we could have two groups. We could have the group of people who want to go to the illegal action and their parents were notified and or gave permission. And then there was the group of folks who wanted to be with the main the main march, that that was where their journey of racial justice was. And then we all met at the end and sang songs and danced and it was really fun. And it was awesome. But it wasn't easy at all. So more on that later. With that, the stop look people, that's what I'm hoping. So. You're next, right? Mike keeps trying to get away from me. We'll see what that means. Greetings, everybody. I'm Reverend Jeremy Nickel. I bring loving greetings from your colleagues and friends and fellow UUs to the west at the Pacific Central District. My congregation, Mission Peak UU, is in Fremont, kind of a little south of Oakland, a little north of San Jose. And uh, it's just been really an honor to be asked to be a part of, of this panel and to be able to join you all here today. So I've been tasked with talking a little bit about the how. How are we going to transform our congregations into places where these new UUs are actually going to want to show up? The how of it. But of course, I've got to tell you a few stories first. So the first thing I want to tell you about is I am just newly back from my first sabbatical. And I actually, my first day back was April 1st, so we know who the joke was on that day. But, you know, you got to pick goals. you gotta, you got to, like, do something with that time. You know, something productive. So one of my goals was uh, to learn how to play the guitar. I'm about to be 40 years old. I have, for a long time, held this notion about myself that I'm not musical. And I preach a lot about that we can really transform our lives by telling ourselves different stories. And I thought, gee, do I have to live that? So I've always, you know, so I, I, I decided I was going to learn, learn to play the guitar. I'm about three or four months into it now, and I'll tell you, it is terrible. <laughs> if you were to see, like, you know, with, with, like, tennis or golf, they, like, list how good everyone is. If you suddenly saw, like, a list of everyone who could play guitar in the world, I would be at the very bottom of the list. And I know this because, you know, I take lessons, and um, the seven-year-old before me and the 11-year-old after me <laughs> are like running away from me rapidly in skill level. So I've been learning a lot about making mistakes, failing, not being good at something. You know, as an adult, we're pretty good at building our lives so that we don't have to do things we're not good at. Isn't that awesome? It's not. It actually turns out to not be so great. It really isn't. So another thing I did on my uh, sabbatical was spend about a month in India. It's a dream of mine for my whole life. And the reason I wanted to do this was uh, the Buddha has been an, an incredibly important teacher in my life, and I, I wanted to visit him. I wanted to have a personal experience of his life, so I went and did a Buddhist pilgrimage. It was incredible. I went, uh, oh, I have pictures here and an ability to show them to you. So, theoretically... Can you forward that? It's turned on. Can you forward, forward it from there? Yeah, there I am. So this is me at the Mahabodhi Temple Complex in Bodh Gaya, where, where Buddha became Buddha, where he sat under that famous Bodhi tree and, and gained enlightenment. I went to all the obvious places. I went to his birthplace in Lumbini, Nepal. It's like this sweetest little backwater you've ever seen in your life. I went to the place where he breathed his last breaths, Kushinagar, India. 
I, of course, went to Deer Park where he gave his first teachings. I had incredible experiences at all these places. The people I met, the meditations I had in these places, oh, the conversations were just incredible. I have so many more Facebook friends now. <laughs> but it was an accidental visit I took to a place I hadn't planned on going that was really the most transformative. When I was in Bodh Gaya, someone said, you know, there's a place about an hour from here where a lot of the struggle happened. You know, we fast forward so often in the story of Gautama's life from leaving his family and his privilege and his wealth to that, that tree. Boom! But there was a lot of time in between there. You know, this picture right here is of a cave up in some mountains I went to. It's called the Dungshuari Cave Complex. He spent six years here. It didn't look like that then. A lot of less decoration, I'm guessing. More of a, a dark cavern. He spent six years here trying a whole lot of different stuff, beta testing Buddhism, you know, like <laughs> fasting and trying different postures out in different locations and chanting and different forms. I mean, he was just trying everything, everything he had known, everything he had been taught. And it got him nowhere. He failed over and over. I can't imagine how frustrating it must have been. He knew there was something there for him and he couldn't get there. I sat in this cave for a while. Not quite ready for that one yet. Yeah, we'll stay here. <laughs> Hate giving up control. It's the worst. Uh, I sat in here for a while and, you know, I, I expected to feel it being dark, cold, remote. It was all those things. But then I started to notice it was kind of cozy in there. It wasn't actually, I could say, I see why he was here for six years. I'm kind of, it's a little cozy in this cave. But eventually he exhausted all the possibilities of this area. He gave up on it, but he didn't give up on what he was doing. He took a trip, took me about an hour, I'm guessing it took him a little longer, down that mountain, found this fig tree, found his enlightenment. Now, there's a lot in this story that really is important to me about how spiritual growth happens for, for people and for communities as well. And it reminds me that spiritual entrepreneurship, which is like that idea of trying to birth something new in our spiritual lives and in, in spiritual congregations, is not so different than regular entrepreneurship in the way that failure matters, in the way that mistakes get us where we need to be. So that's really a lot about what I want to talk to you about is embracing failure. Now, I know why we don't talk about this part of Buddha's life. We hate talking about failure. We like to think about our heroes as like perfect from the womb. They just needed to kind of unfold the dialectic a little bit and there it was, but that's just not the case. Failure and mistake dot these stories so clearly, and we cannot miss that. And I believe that we UUs have a lot directly to learn from this story. First of all, do we not wish to better know the world as he did so we can serve it more fully? I think we do. But do we not get seduced by the dark comfort of our caves? We call them churches. <laughs> but God, it's so comfortable in there, isn't it? I love all the people there. They're so nice, and I know them, and they know me. And we talk about our values and we sing about them. It's a comfy place. We need to get out of them, into the world where the stuff happens, just like he did. And do we not too often create congregational cultures that are so afraid of getting something wrong that our leaders become paralyzed? That are just so scared of mistake and failure that we don't do anything? Am I the only one? Do any of you have congregations like this? Yeah? Leadership paralysis. Yeah, I've seen it from the inside. In Silicon Valley, we have a saying, fail stands for our first attempt in learning. First attempt in learning. If you're not failing, you're not trying. Let's see that next slide. Mistakes are the portals of discovery. If there's nothing else you remember from anything I say this weekend, hold on to that one from James Joyce. Mistakes 
are the portals of discovery. Now, if you're a member of a congregation or you're a person who's got it all figured out, don't worry about anything I have to say. But if you're thinking there might be still some stuff for you to learn, you might want to start embracing failure. So these are the three things in my congregation that we aspire to. to you know, We're working on making this shift. And we've talked about what are the things we need to really embody to make this shift. So the first one is you've got to create a culture in your congregation that embraces and celebrates failure. Okay? Now, what does that really mean? You've got to empower your lay and professional leaders to try things without a guarantee of success. We happen to have this desire for things to be all perfect and worked out and we know where the turns are going to be and where the mistakes are going to... No. You can't get to that point. You need to be okay with saying yes to things and not knowing how it's going to go. You need to preach and teach about mistakes and failure. I was blown away the other day, I don't know if any of you saw this, a Princeton professor published his CV, his curriculum vitae, on all his failures. Okay, it wasn't a list of all the great things. He listed every place he had tried to publish a paper that turned him down, every school that rejected him when he was trying to be a student, every school that rejected him when he was trying to be a professor. And this is a guy who's at Princeton, so he's probably pretty smart. But failure and mistake dotted his career. And he said, this CV of my failure, this is what I really have to give to you. Here's my learnings. You see this final product here. This isn't the real story. We need to figure out ways to do that in our congregation. Owning, naming our mistakes, and sharing the learnings that we make from experiencing that. And not being ashamed that we didn't get it all right, but celebrating that we did something and that we learned something and we were changed by it, right? So that's the first thing we need to do. We need to create a culture that celebrates failure, that embraces it. That's at least, let's, let's start with this, a little bit comfortable with it. That's a good place to start. We'll get to celebration later. Number two, we need to follow our leaders lay, professional, whatever you consider your leaders to be, out of our caves and into the community. Because the, the truth is, our congregations are made up of dozens, hundreds, so many people that are plugged into our community doing the stuff we think we need to be doing, all in these little different groups. They're connected to every important organization in your town. Someone is. They are already at the social justice meeting. Someone is. You need to follow them out of your cave and say, how can we make this thing you're doing better? How can we enhance this? You need to follow your leaders out of your caves. Third thing we need to do, try, try, try again, screw up, reevaluate, keep trying. Keep trying new things because you don't know right now. Whatever it is, you don't know. We think we know, we think we have an idea, we don't. It will be revealed to us by trying and by being humble about what comes back to us and owning the reality of it. So I just wanna give you one other little quick story about how this has played out in my congregation. I just wanna see again if I can use this thing. That's not where I thought we'd go. <laughs> it's okay. We can skip it. So uh, in my first couple of years of ministry, I worked on getting a pot of money outside of our budget that we could do stuff with. Because, you know, we pretty much know what the budget has to go to. It's got to go to staff. It's got to keep the lights on. We've got to print that order of service. That's where the budget's going. Fair share, of course, and all that. So, so we worked, I worked on, on fundraising outside of the budget process and having this chunk of money we could do something else with. And as we approached the first budget cycle and we didn't really do anything with it, I kind of understood that. We approached the second budget cycle and it was still sitting there and I thought, well, that's strange. We were approaching the third budget cycle of having this money and I said, what is going on here? 
And I sat down with a bunch of my leaders separately, and I said, you know, we got this opportunity here. we got this money to do something with, something new. I don't know what it is we got to do. And they each said to me something like this. I don't want to be the one who screws it up. I don't want to be the one who takes this great opportunity and says the idea and then it fails and everyone says, you're the one who ruined the whole thing. Every single one of them was feeling something like that. And I said, well, don't you think we're kind of missing the opportunity now? Right now by not doing anything? That seems to me the lost opportunity. So we, we had a real powwow. I had to bring in, I didn't have a beard yet. There's a lot of authority that comes with this thing. So I had to bring in someone with a beard to talk to them about this. <laughs> and it was super effective. I highly recommend that strategy. <laughs> and they really heard it then. You know, we got to do something. So, so they followed our leaders. They said, what, what are we doing? What's really working? Um, and they remembered that a bunch of years ago, we had worked with this group to start a little garden. And it was really great. Everyone loved the garden. We were making fresh fruits and vegetables. It felt like our values. We were doing it together. And wouldn't you know it, but the same group had just been gifted this trash-strewn lot that they don't have the resources to, to rehabilitate and do all the things they want to do. What if, we, what if we partnered with them? So we sat down with them. It seemed like this is great. I had some incredible pictures to show you. Um, we wrote this memoriam of understanding. I'd never been a part of one of those before, but we did that. We made all these decisions about how we were going to share resources, some staff time, volunteers, of course, money. We got going, and man, it was like a train wreck at first. Really a mess. I mean, we had hired this staff person that we called an outreach director to help us with this, and we kept asking him to like, help with our canvas. It's like outreach or inreach or, you know, the, the partnership with this other group. Like, we thought we had, we had written all the right stuff down, but oh my God, there's like so many questions that come up when you're doing this work. And we had to again and again say, we screwed up. We didn't think of this. We didn't see this coming. We didn't know this is how it was going to go. Rework that in memoriam of understanding, re-evaluate, recalibrate, and we got there. Last year, we, we grew 1,000 pounds of fresh vegetables there to our local food kitchen, the only source of fresh vegetables this year, 2,000 pounds. We've taught dozens and hundreds of kids about permaculture gardens and drought gardens, which in California is a really important thing. And so from the outside, it looks like that Princeton professor. It looks like this really beautiful thing that happened. But we know, we learned, that was one of our big learnings. Yep, it really is hard to do this stuff. You're really going to make a lot of mistakes along the way. You got to bake that in. You got to be humble about it. And you got to be willing to say, I screwed up. We didn't see this. We need to talk. But if you do, you'll get there. That's the reason we got there. Not because it was a good idea at the beginning. No. Because we kept recalibrating along the way. So those are my three takeaways for you. To help you also to aspire to be that that new congregation that these new you use are going to be attracted to. You gotta start your culture on a path to celebrating and being comfortable with failure. You need to follow your leaders out of your caves and you need to just keep trying and trying and trying again. And remember this, hey, hey, there's my people. And there's the, okay, we're getting somewhere now. Here's the trash strewn lot, a little cleaned up, turning into a garden. Yeah, we got one more here. Here's our first planting. And so then here's the thing, if we go to the next one, people started noticing, and keep going here, we got four, yeah, all these people started showing up who weren't our people yet. That's my hope for you. That's my hope for you. Thank you so much. Kenny and Jeremy, thank you. Thank you, Kenny, for giving us a bit of a path of who we want to be, the stop look people. And thank you, Jeremy, for talking us through how we might get there, failing and trying again and telling people about it. Um, I'm having a little bit of a full circle moment, so I need to share that with you. Um, I'm Reverend Elizabeth Wynn. I serve our Unitarian Universalist Association supporting ministries to youth and young adults of color. I live in Boston, um, but I was born right here in St. Paul, Minnesota. What, what? 
And I gotta, I gotta do a Kenny because my dad immigrated to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so I'm a Badger, so Wisconsin. And I'm looking out at some of the ministers that I had at my home congregation uh, in Ohio, and I see Richard, and I saw Mary, and I see Greg, and I see Shannon, a religious educator there, so I feel like I am among friends and grateful to be able to be with you. Um, so this, uh, this metaphor I want to share, okay, stereograms, do people know what that is? Okay, I didn't know what it was called either, but it's that thing that um, has another thing inside of it, but it just looks like dots or squiggles, and it's usually on the wall of like a waiting room where you might be for a really long time and get really bored, and then you might stare at it, and then if you like look at it, but not too hard, it'll like pop out, like bam, a tricycle. Do people, have people seen this? Is this like a, th okay. So I learned that they're called stereograms. Um, and I want to talk about some of the things that are hidden, that are hard to see in the who is with us on this journey. The who that is with us on this journey into the new era of Unitarian Universalism. And um, the, the thing with the stereograms, when I was a kid, I remember sitting in the pediatrician's room, waiting room, looking at the thing on the wall and thinking like, I can, I can, I can see it. Yeah, I can totally see it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, and just totally faking it. But wanting like so badly to see it, it's like that really bad pun that someone tells you and then you don't get until a little bit later, but then you really even don't get it. Like, um, <laughs> how did Moses uh, make his tea? He brews it. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, see, it's okay if you still don't get it, because we're just all faking it. Um, so, so I think there's, there's two pieces that are close to my heart in terms of the who that is with us on this journey that's hard to see. And one of those who's is the people I serve in my ministry, Unitarian Universalists, youth and young adults of color, many of whom grew up UU. And you have some living, breathing specimens on stage and maybe some amazing people in the chairs um, who, who grew up UU and who are UU young, youth and young adults of color. And we are already on this journey. We are already on this journey. Um, one of the things that I get to do is support Thrive programs, which are national leadership gatherings for Unitarian Universalist youth and young adults of color. Um, and it is truly one of the greatest gifts to witness and share in creating what Unitarian Universalism looks like by and for young UUs of color. And no one knows more than those folks, of which I am one, uh, how vital and salvific being gathered in community, like Kenny was sharing about, can be. Um, and so I just want to share a few quotes from UU youth and young adults of color uh, who have applied to attend this summer's Thrive programs, because I just want their voices to be in this room. So one young person writes, due to being one of the only youth of color at my church, I have found myself attending fewer and fewer services due to the plethora of microaggressions. I miss the sense of belonging I had before feeling like I was being used as their token youth of color. I hope this program will bring my love of the church back so I can give it a second chance. Another young person writes, in my youth group, there are only two other people of color and about 20 people that are Caucasian. This makes it really hard for my youth group to discuss racial issues because unlike me, very few of them have personally experienced racism. Another writes, I've been fortunate to grow up in a fairly multiracial congregation. However, I'll be heading off to college in the fall and I fear that I will not meet many other Unitarian Universalists and that if I find them, they will not be ethnically diverse. I want to plan how to continue my connection with my faith while in college and make connections with other racially diverse Unitarian Universalists. And finally, a young person writes, I've heard that many youth lose their Unitarian Universalist connections when they leave home. I don't want this to happen to me. 
and I know that Thrive will solidify my link to this faith community. Some really smart people in our faith movement. We each, I believe, whether we're board members or religious educators, RE committee members, parents, ministers, greeters, justice leaders, musicians, regional staff, camp and conference center volunteers, the blessed champions of coffee hour, and they are blessed, have a role to play in supporting ministry to and with young Unitarian Universalists of color. And just so we're clear, we all have a role whether or not there are Unitarian Universalist youth and young adults of color showing up on Sunday mornings in our communities. We each have our role and our roles are different. Our roles may be about facing our own implicit biases as some of our worship leaders so beautifully shared about. Might be about inviting that person in our congregation out to coffee who's confused about why we need to do racial justice work. It may be about figuring out how to talk about race with young people in a way that starts with I and my story and not with assumptions about you and your story. It may be about having a conversation on the team that you lead in your congregation about how race, identity, and privilege impact your decision-making process. It may be about advocating funding to support people of color and their leadership development. Figuring out our roles is actually really, really complicated, especially when we're trying to support someone whose identity we may or may not share. I want to share a real example, because I think we're all here for some real things. I just preached a sermon uh, in a suburb of Boston where I mentioned being both Irish and Vietnamese. After worship, no one came up to me to talk about being Irish. This is right outside of Boston, right? <laughs> And multiple people came up to talk to me about being Vietnamese. And I am so delighted to share about the rich spiritual connections and the many gifts of my Vietnamese ancestry. And inevitably, the themes were about how kind Vietnamese people are, how good the food was when someone's friend of a friend visited, how beautiful it was despite its poverty, and also some thoughts about the Vietnam War that ended almost 41 years ago today. And sometimes I think I'm just going to start going up to white ministers after they preach their sermons and saying, um, you know, I met a white person once, and they were really <laughs> generous and friendly. Yeah. I'll take it, I'll take it. And, um, you know, I heard about a war once that some white people fought in. And, and, I, and I, I feel a little nervous, even though this is a true story from my heart, because I know that I have been that person who has said something like that to someone else. This is not something that any one of us doesn't do. We say an oops, an ouch, and we need to apologize. But I share it because while we each have a role in supporting you youth and young adults of color, our roles are different because of our own identities and because of where we are on our journeys. Um, a, a question for us as leaders, and I want us to carry this question throughout the weekend with us, is who is already on this journey but is not getting their spiritual needs met? And what are our roles in making sure that those spiritual needs might be met? And then, I want to share one more piece um, about that thing that's hard to see, the thing in the stereogram that might be there, but maybe we just can't quite see it. And that is about the ways that we are already serving younger Unitarian Universalists, but we might just not be shouting from the rooftops or sharing. And they might be hard to see, but we're doing it, and we can celebrate, can celebrate that. Um, after my second year of college, I had an internship with a public defender. I worked in family court, and I lived with my own family in Rochester, New York. They were amazing people. They are amazing people, but busy with their own lives and small children. And so I spent that summer kind of floating. I floated into the sorrow of the courtrooms, too air-conditioned and full of tears and stories. And I floated home on the bus to eat pretzels with peanut butter, and a couch covered with tiny people and their tiny toys 
and their not-so-tiny messes. <laughs> and I floated back, and I summarized case notes and watched lives change with a bang of that gavel, and I realized my boss was a jerk, and the sorrow of the courtroom became something of my own sorrow. And instead of going to his office, I just went to the court and watched all the cases I could. High-profile homicides with the media and a prosecutor in a shiny suit, the small tragedies of tenant court and small claims. And in between it all, on Sundays, my aunt, bless her, let me take her car and park it and its Buffalo Bills bumper stickers at First Unitarian Church in Rochester. And I wandered into this UU church, and I didn't talk to anyone, and I sat in the back, and I drank the free coffee, and I definitely didn't pledge or join a small group or give of my time, talent, or treasure. I don't think I even graduated to the non-disposable name tag, let's be real. <laughs> All I remember is that I was sinking down, and the wondrous and familiar love of Unitarian Universalism gathered me up. United Church of Christ minister, Reverend Lillian Daniel, writes this about her own congregation. She says, when people join our church, we always say, we give thanks for every community that has ever been your spiritual home. So I give thanks for First Unitarian in Rochester, which for a very brief summer, when I sat in the back, was my spiritual home. And I have to say that being my spiritual home that summer in college was young adult ministry, and it was not like magic, razzmatazz, young adult, shiny, social media, perfect young adult ministry, but it was very, very real. And a few years later, when I found myself hitchhiking to yet another UU church, this one in Falmouth, Massachusetts, with grass stains on my shirt after a late night, yes, practicing rugby tackles with a girl, <laughs> and I showed up. And some very generous souls during coffee hour made an announcement and said, who would like to give a ride to this random young adult who's hitchhiked to our church? <laughs> so bless the Falmouth New Church as well. And I, I want to believe that those congregations and those ministers didn't see me as a freeloader who would come and go and never pledge, never teach people how to use Google Docs or tweet. I want to believe that they saw me, and I, 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 well, I will teach you about Google Docs, but not about tweeting, because I don't know. <laughs> I want to believe that they saw me as a Unitarian Universalist with a home in our free faith, even if I didn't have a congregation. I want to believe that they welcomed me out of a spirit of generosity and abundance. And so I want us to believe that every time a young adult or someone of any age wanders into our sanctuaries and wanders out and is never seen again, that may not be a failure. Our sanctuaries may be a place where you can wander in and find love abundant and sit in the back and drink at the free coffee and leave. So my second question for us to think on uh, tonight and tomorrow and Sunday morning is who are we already serving but we're not telling the story of, or we don't know how to tell it. Is it your board president who is a respected nonprofit leader who mentors young local, local young professionals? Is it the youth advisor who shares their screen printing equipment and know-how with the youth group and has become known by all the high school students as the person to go to if you need to make a t-shirt? Is it your minister who's become the de facto interfaith advisor to local college students showing up at Holy Day celebrations and connecting young adults to local spiritual communities. As we figure out who we need to be in this new era we yearn to create, may we learn to be a home for the hitchhikers and transient, how to be drop-in and forever, how to serve those who are already there, and I see some photos of the youth and young adults of color from last year's uh, national gathering how to unearth the stories of how we are already serving younger UUs, reveal what they are, what we're already doing, and do that more. Together, may we stare at that stereogram, glimpse whatever is in there, learn to see a little deeper about who we are on this journey, who is already here, and how we can support them. Yeah.
So, all right. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So, now we're just going to talk. And uh, for about 20, 20 more minutes? 15. 15. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, I just want to say um, that what really landed for me about, about what you said, Elizabeth, was that idea of experiencing something once and it sticking with you. Um, and it's like that idea that, so for me, probably the most meaningful experience I had in a UU space, aside from the story I told, was, was, um, was actually getting a tour from, I think he just left actually, from uh, Rob. Not Eller. to kill anyone out. Yeah, but I th sorry man. Um, <laughs> but like just being in an old historic building um, and, you know, I'm never going to go to that church. I don't live in Minnesota. But for whatever reason, Rob gave me an hour of his time to share his church's experience. Um, and Jeremy, what really landed about what, what you said was um, uh, talking about failure. That for me, that I'm on this stage is because I failed. Um, I failed. So I was on the path to ministry, to ordain ministry and had a really intense um, depressive episode in 2013 um, and left Divinity School. I was at Harvard and moved away to like hide out in Colorado and just happened to like find my people there and to find my way there. And now I'm <laughs> doing what I was, thought I was gonna do anyway, just in a totally different way um, from a totally different place. And, um, you know, thinking about that version of me in 2013, I had no idea I would be like sitting here with y'all. Um, and so that idea of embracing failure was really, really meaningful. To, so thank you both for, for those nuggets as we go wherever we're going to go in the next few minutes. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that became obvious to me as I was listening to you both, you know, as the, the white male up here who uses he and his and him, um, temporarily able-bodied and all that. And I'm talking about mistakes, right? How, how important it is to fail and make mistakes and also completely aware of our UU history of making a lot of mistakes around racial justice. And where is there a difference there that we need to explore? Is that, you know, how many times can you say I'm sorry? How many times can you say I heard your ouch and really be authentic about that? Uh, so I think one of the things that I'm really holding from what both of you said is, you know, mistakes are really important and getting it right is really important sometimes too. And we have taken a long time to get there with racial justice. I think we've had our first attempt in learning, probably our second and third. So um, yeah, I'm hoping that's one that we can, we can start to really move forward on. And uh, certainly inspirational to hear you both talk about how we might get there. Yeah, um, so I, I like to say we're already saved from perfection because it just makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> um, it, yeah, the, the failure stuff feels really real for me also. And it's interesting because I, yes, I think historically, systemically, there's some real questions like can, it, how much can institutions change and shift? And um, I'm not so great at culture shift I'm pretty good at culture creation, which is why I love these annual programs that bring people together where we get to like sing on the train and like create a spirit that doesn't live anywhere else or doesn't live as many places as we might hope it would. Um, but I think one question is like, for each of us, where are our gifts? Are we, you know, they're not bright lines, but are we culture creators or culture shifters? Um, because I think there are real questions about institutions and how much they can, they can shift. Um, um, but I think it's, it's really interesting because I actually think the embodied practices of failure and of engaging conflict that you were talking about, Kenny, those are the very practices that actually help us do our racial justice work better, more powerfully, more boldly, with greater risk and authenticity. Um, there's something about, this is true for me, if I like think about something for 17 days and go to like four workshops and read seven books about it, 
I will become less able to try to do that thing than maybe if like Jeremy and Kenny like told me a little bit about it one day and then I tried it and then I survived and then I learned oh like I'm still here like I did it and it was really imperfect and I'm, I'm I still exist and I you know I see Lena in the back like there's some amazing amazing pedagogy happening that is helping people to try something, whether it's direct action for racial justice, demanding justice for Jamar Clark, or something else, and do it, and then be like, oh, we're still here. Like, it wasn't perfect, but like, yes. we're better able, and I feel like that's what unfolded for you, Kenny, and those amazing youth leaders, of like, oh, like, we, we, could, we could do it, and it could be imperfect. So, I actually think there's something about failing that 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 helps us in this current movement moment in terms of how we engage because um, if we like sit on it and educate ourselves until we're like super 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 educated at least for me that's actually not a good strategy for moving forward. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So I was following along on Twitter a little bit what people have been tweeting that they thought was interesting from us. Uh, Ashley, I see you. You're always rocking the Twitter life. Um, you know, it's... Oh, I feel so behind. Yeah, what's been said? <laughs> Fill us in. Well, I'm not going to just read <laughs> tweets, but uh, I will tell you that it seemed like... It seemed like one theme that also really uh, I've been thinking about a lot is this idea of imperfectly disrupting. Like not having all of the language to say, well, that is a grade two microaggression. And like, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think they have grades, but I just made that up. Um, <laughs> but to like, to do something, um, to when we see, to, when there's a moment and you can feel it in your body, like something is off, um, to however imperfectly to do something. And um, so, there's another short story I wanted to tell, which is of a middle school con that was about five weeks after the MLK con I told you about. And so at this one, it was, it was gender stuff that came up. And um, how there were a group of eighth grade boys who were harassing one of the senior high, like senior counselors, um, who identifies as, as a woman, and like thought it was funny and thought they were being flirtatious and all of that stuff. And the, the norm in that situation is to, you know, call the community together and there has been, uh, there has been, you know, some inappropriate behavior and just to talk about it in this really general way. Well, like, no, we need to talk to like those four you know, in a way that other folks could hear the problem too, but like we needed those four people to understand they were messing up. And so how do you do that in a way that's like covenantal? Because it was super awkward. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm a grown adult, working on it at least, and, um, and like I'm terrified to tell these 13 year old boys that they're being sexist, because that's how sexism works, okay. is like it operates on, it fuels off of silence and not disrupting. And so like, I had that moment after you know, giving these speeches of like, disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. I was like, oh gosh, I have to do this now. Um, <laughs> crap. <laughs> and I, you know, I just, um, a group of like two other male identified advisors, you know, the seven of us sat in this room and the three, you know, the three of us advisors like stammered through, you know, here's why, this was, here's why we think this is really off. And you know, one of them, one of the boys was like furious and called his parents and you know these PC this and that. The other three were like so pumped by the end of the weekend to like learn about sexism. I can tell you that nothing that we said in that room felt quotable. You know, it did not feel like we did, we should make a YouTube video like how to disrupt sexism. <laughs> we just stammered our way through it, but like we did something, and I just wanted to share that because. Um, you know, Elizabeth said at another thing, if you didn't notice, Elizabeth's pretty dope and pretty great. And um, 
Elizabeth said at another gathering that there's only two choices when it comes to justice work, and that's between an imperfect movement and no movement. And um, th I think that's about as true as it gets. It's a mic drop. And I just would you like this mic to drop, Elizabeth? <laughs> uh, a little bit, but I think the sound people would be less. <laughs> I do just want to say that um, you, religious educator, um, help me with her name, Lila uh, Ibrahim, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, she, I was riffing off of her, and she said, "There's, there's no choice between the only choices between imperfect community and no community." I guess, you know, the, the final thing I want to say, just from kind of synthesizing what I'm hearing, is one of my favorite Miles Davis quotes, which is, uh, when you play a wrong note, it's the next one that makes it good or bad. Mm. You know, we have all wrong notes in our past, as a movement, as congregations, as people. None of us have been perfect. So what are you going to do about it? What's your next move? Yeah. Oh. Amen. Um, well, I just, there, since, since it seems clear that racial justice is a priority in our world and for our UU movement, um, I do want to say that for me there is something um, that is un uniquely pushes the need to not fail and be perfect that is about whiteness. And so part of figuring out how to disrupt it is also about figuring out how we can I think it's Rebecca Parker who says, like, bless what you can and what you can't bless make new. So figuring out, like, what about our, our many stories of whiteness do we need to transform so that there's more room for failure and imperfection? And um, the other thing I'll say is I forget who in the worship talked about, like, we're fighting for our lives. People are fighting for their lives, like, literally. Um, and I think there's a way in which that urgency can drive us more towards perfection and needing to get it right every time, or it can really like loose us and liberate us to say like, well, people are fighting for our lives, so we just have to do things and we'll mess up and we'll take care of each other and we'll like yeah. sing songs and we'll pray and we'll figure it out. And I'm not smart enough to know what the difference is, what pushes the, the urgency, like whether that goes towards gosh, we have to get it right, or whether it goes towards, like we're, like, we're fighting for our lives, so let's just like, do some stuff, and we'll learn. Um, but if anyone figures that out, <laughs> we should talk. Yeah, one of the other, I guess I would say, like, norms of whiteness that I really feel is live um, is that idea of when we come together that... Uh, it's kind of like what you're saying about being polished and about like having the complete package. But another one that another one that I really see a lot um, that as someone who grew up in UU space in white suburbia in a white UU church, uh, like super whiteness um, everywhere in South Texas, is this idea that um, that like certain what, what is needed is to like achieve a certain level of anti-racist or you know to like have all of the stuff and so I grew up like I said in Texas and one of the things that can like really set me off is when people who are from I'll just say like Boulder Colorado or Boston or the Bay Area or whatever like bash the south if you want to see me like go off I because like the south is more racist or the South is more whatever. And it's certainly more obvious. I mean, it's more overt, there's no doubt. But I'll tell you, as someone who went to, who's lived in four places, in two red states, Missouri's like more red than blue, um, and then living, I've lived in Boston, I've lived in Denver. Um, the worst moments I've experienced when it comes to race are in Boston and Denver. And I will tell you also that, um, I've had small town, like moderate to conservative folks who I would like want to go to bat for me before a lot of like perfect 
liberal minded, you know, have all the right red, you know, I read Tennessee Coates and, and uh, Audre Lorde is on my dish, whatever, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. I'm just going to pretend that didn't happen. Say from perfection. <laughs> right, yeah, Say, yeah. We're saved. Yeah. <laughs> that there's, that there's something about, there's something for me, like when I, when I think about who I want on my side, there's something about someone who's just like, whatever their context, they're trying to do better and that they're willing to as my dad would say, roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. Um, and I don't, like, I don't really, in a larger sense, I definitely care who you vote for, but like on a basic level, I just wanna know, are you gonna be with me or not? Um, and that's what's most important to me. So I just wanted to throw that into the room as well. Thank you. Well, I think unless you two have more to say, we should invite Dory up here to give our final instructions. Yeah. Dory, right, does that work for you? Thank you all. Thank you so much. There were many times during your conversations that I found myself getting a little teared up and really loving what you were saying, so thank you.